Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, a study has shown that spinosaurs were not just fish eaters and could have also taken on big land animals, a new dinosaur has been named after a gnome, a prehistoric sea cow was found with evidence of being attacked by crocs and sharks, and much, much more. Starting off the news this week, we have talking monkeys. A study published in the journal Science has found that marmoset monkeys actually have names for one another that they use when communicating. Now, we're not saying that one's going to turn around and shout Kevin to get his mate's attention, but marmosets communicate with each other using what is called a fecal. By analysing these fecal dialogues between these monkeys, the researchers were able to isolate pairs of dialogue and find unique sounds that they were reserving to get the attention of the other. In other words, they were using names to call out to each other. Even more interestingly, the dialect used for names is notably different to the dialect used for other communication and these dialects were similar within the marmoset family groups. Monitoring the response was also important. They did indeed find that these monkeys responded to other marmosets calling their name. The use of names is not something that is exclusively human, and dolphins and elephants have also been known to refer to each other with names. But this is the first time a non-human primate has been observed exhibiting this behaviour. It is thought that they may have evolved this ability to help them communicate in the dense rainforests where they live. In other news, a study published in the journal Nature has revealed for the first time the detection of planet Earth's ambipolar electrostatic field. Back in the 20th century, scientists realised that there was an outflow of particles leaving the atmosphere around the poles of the planet that seemed to defy what we knew about escaping particles. It was expected that some could give particles enough energy to leave the stricter confines of our atmosphere, but the particles being detected at the poles had not been heated, as you would expect, and were going much, much faster than they ought to have been. The ambipolar electrostatic field was theorised to be the cause of this unexpected ion escape into space, and that's exactly what this study hoped to confirm. For a long time, nothing in space had the technology to detect something as weak as the ambipolar field would be, but in 2022, the spacecraft Endurance launched from the Svalbard region in Norway with the correct equipment to detect this elusive part of our planet's atmosphere. It did indeed measure a very small electric potential drop, but it was the measurements the scientists were expecting and have now, crucially, been able to accurately measure the ambipolar field for further study. The researchers predict that this new data can help us better understand how our planet's atmosphere has been shaped and help us better model planets from around the universe that would also have an ambipolar field. Also in the news, there's been an update on the orcas versus yachts situation. Orcas off the coast of Iberia have been interacting with yachts since 2020. They have a particular interest in the rudders, sometimes just nuzzling it, sometimes taking bites out of it, and occasionally they have inflicted enough damage on it that it has led to the boat sinking. There have been many hypotheses as to why this small, endangered population of orcas are doing this. A recently published paper has put forward the latest hypothesis, which is that the orcas are practicing catching their prey. These orcas hunt and eat bluefin tuna. These mighty fish can reach lengths of 4 metres or 13 feet and weigh up to 907 kilograms or 2,000 pounds. They often have white underbellies and hydrodynamically shaped bodies. This similarity to yachts has not gone unnoticed. These tuna can reach speeds of 28 miles per hour and can accelerate as fast as a Porsche. Catching them is no mean feat and requires practice, and humans are providing them with the ideal training opportunity. Many animals use play as a means to develop and refine the skills needed to hunt their prey. The observations made while the orcas interact with the yachts suggest that they are indeed fine-tuning their hunting technique. For more on orca interactions with boats, then go to Ben's mum's channel One World, where she has a number of videos on the subject. Links will be in the sources. 
First up in the paleontology news for this week, a fossil of a prehistoric sea cow has been discovered, which preserves evidence of some pretty brutal attacks by crocodilians and sharks. This poor old sea cow is a kind of ancient dugong that lived about 20 million years ago. It was unearthed in Venezuela and consists of a partial skeleton, including bits of the skull, several vertebrae and some ribs, and the bones are absolutely covered in bite marks. The snout of the animal displays punctures as well as some deep gouges that appear to have been inflicted by a prehistoric crocodilian engaging in a death roll while it had its jaws around the dugong. Poor guy. Different bite marks consistent with shark teeth are also present across the skeleton, plus an isolated tooth was discovered between the dugong's neck and ribcage, indicating that a prehistoric tiger shark most likely made these bites. This guy could not catch a break. <laughs> The paleontologists hypothesise that this rather unfortunate dugong was first killed by the croc, which seems to have targeted the head and then later was scavenged by the sharks, since the shark bite marks are more irregularly distributed. Although it's a sad story for this ancient sea cow, it provides a fantastic glimpse into the prehistoric world and how these animals interacted with one another so long ago. <laughs> Poor dude. Next, we welcome a new species of dinosaur this week. It's a new kind of hadrosaurid, the herbivorous dinosaurs commonly known as the duckbills, and it was discovered in 72.5 million year old rocks in northern Mexico. It's called Coahuilasaurus lipani, after the state of Coahuila in Mexico, where it was found, and it's represented by a partial skull and jaws that display many features indicating it's a new species. This would have been a pretty big animal at an estimated 8 metres in total length, and the skull fragments indicate that the snout was notably downturned. Coahuilasaurus tells paleontologists a lot about the evolution of these dinosaurs at this time, and since the formation it comes from dates to the same time as another formation in Canada, the differences in which dinosaur species were present in both provide some fascinating insight into how these animals were dispersed across the prehistoric North American landmass of Laramidia. And there's been another new dinosaur named this week as well. This time it's a new kind of ceratopsian dinosaur, the group that includes the famous frilled and horned species such as Triceratops. This new species is quite an early branching member of the group, lacking horns and only having a small frill, and it would have walked about on two legs a lot of the time. It was uncovered in Japan in early Cretaceous aged rocks dating to around 112 million years ago, and it's been named Sasayamanomus saguaro which is absolutely brilliant as it's named after the Sasayama Basin in Japan, as well as Gnomus, the Latin root for gnome. It's a gnome dinosaur. Anyway, paleontologists have found a relatively complete but fragmented skull from the species, as well as a couple of bones from the body. The gnome dinosaur is also very important for reasons other than being a gnome dinosaur as it's now the easternmost record of Ceratopsians from the Eurasian continent, and its position as an early branching member of the lineage provides some important insight into the evolution of these amazing animals. It was also found to be a close relative of the North American Aquilops, refining our understanding of when and how Ceratopsians migrated from Asia into North America, which likely occurred between 115 to maybe 108 million years ago, also aligning with when the Bering Land Bridge appeared, allowing the dinosaurs to cross continents, so another amazing discovery this week. Also in the news this week, there's been a paper published on Spinosaurus, and so you know we couldn't resist talking about it. Spinosaurus are often compared to crocodilians due to the similarities of their long snouts, teeth and their aquatic tendencies. Controversial. This has led to many comparisons being drawn between how crocs and spinosaurs feed too. In this new research, paleontologists have put some of these assumptions about their similarities to the test by measuring the tooth sockets of species from both groups, as well as comparing the tooth crowns and overall jaw anatomy. They discovered that there's actually a surprising amount of difference between both lineages. While there were also some similarities, it calls into question whether we should consider spinosaurs as crocodilian mimics in how they lived and caught prey. Spinosaurs had teeth similar in shape to some slender snouted crocodilians that specialise in eating fish, but overall they had larger teeth than crocs and their general snout shape was more like that of generalist feeding crocodilians. 
reptilians. Spinosaurs would have been good at quickly striking, inflicting deep punctures and holding on to quite soft prey items, and this all shows that they wouldn't have been restricted to feeding on only fish or small animals. The researchers also found differences in how the Baryonychene and Spinosaurine subfamilies handled prey with the Baryonychines likely eating animals that required minimal oral processing, since they had lots of relatively small teeth at the front of their jaws. On the other hand, the Spinosaurines, which includes Spinosaurus itself, had larger teeth and longer concavities and convexities on their upper and lower jaws, giving them an undulating jaw margin useful for holding bigger objects in place. So overall, the study concludes that the Spinosaurs were a unique group of animals with an intriguing mode of life. And although they had some similarities to crocs, they wouldn't have just been fish eaters. So species such as Spinosaurus in particular would have been entirely capable of tracking more oversized prey items, and like many modern predators could have been opportunistic hunters, taking whatever they could get their jaws on. Also in the recent paleo news, a new species of prehistoric crocodiliform has been named this week. It comes from a late Cretaceous aged formation in Brazil, dating to between 88 and 68 million years ago, and is known from a fragmented skull plus a single rib piece. It's been named Apoidosuchus tavaresse, and it's a kind of crocodiliform known as a notosuchian, a very diverse and extraordinary group of modern croc relatives that had all sorts of different terrestrial lifestyles, including herbivorous species. Species. Apoidosuchus is a member of the Notosuchian group Sabekia, which were mostly terrestrial carnivores. However, this study also presents a refined review of Sabekian evolution, which demonstrates that the subfamily Apoidosuchus belongs to, called Pepesuchinae, were likely semi aquatic piscivorous forms. So, this group of Sabekians had gone from being terrestrial back to occupying semi aquatic niches where they were freshwater ecosystems vacant of other non Sebekian semi-aquatic croc relatives, just in case croc evolution couldn't get any more complicated, or the words any more complicated. It's another fantastic discovery that adds significantly to our understanding of these reptiles' evolution. And finally for the news this week, a paper has been published discussing the evolution of the cave lion as it shrank over time and the possible implications of this change. It explains how the Eurasian fossil record of the cave lion Panthera spelea illustrates a general and gradual shrinking in overall body size, with the smallest known adults coming from not long before the species went extinct, around 13,000 years ago. This size decrease may have occurred due to a combination of changing landscapes and climatic conditions a decline in their prey, or even due to competition with or hunting by humans. So what did these smaller body sizes mean for the species when they came into contact with other carnivores of the time? The paper discusses how, whereas the older and largest cave lion subspecies would have been much too large for many other predators to attack, the younger and smaller cave lions would have been placed at risk of attack by wolves and other prehistoric wild dogs, as well as cave bears. This would have further compounded their vulnerable position as smaller predators, and might have ultimately been another contributing factor to their extinction. Another very interesting paper, with some absolutely wonderful paleo art of these prehistoric animals included. Well, that's it for the news this week. I hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Benji Thomas if you'd like for more short form videos about science news and extinct animals. You can also follow me on Instagram at Miss Amelia Evans. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.